We're going to move on now to the effects of anesthetics on the circulation and show again that the effects of anesthetics on the circulation are remarkably similar, particularly during maintenance of anesthesia, but during other times as well, depending on the concentrations of anesthetic that are delivered. For example, at sub-anesthetic concentrations, the effects of potent inhaled agents or nitrous oxide are fairly minimal. There are changes that occur, some of which are uh, rather interesting. Uh, for example, in the original studies that we did on volunteers given desferrin, we measured the temperature of the toe. Why would we do that? We were interested in peripheral vasodilation, just as, as you say. The digits, both those in your fingers and the toes, are very important to temperature regulation. There are chunks within both the toes and fingers, which allow you to lose or conserve heat, depending on whether they're used or not used. And so we measured, indeed, the temperature in the toe. We turned the desferrin on. We got to about 2% desferrin. You can see that the toe temperatures went up. This is 26 degrees versus 34, 35 degrees. They really went up a lot, showing the vasodilation. At less than a third of MAC, a quarter of MAC, uh, that's not unique to desperate. That would be something that would happen with isofluorine, cefalofluorine, any potent inhaled anesthetic. What implications does it have clinically? You can lose a large amount of body heat in a very short amount of time. You could lose a lot of body heat. Or transfer body heat from the core to the periphery, which is what Dan Sessler has shown and his group have, have shown. What's the, now you've got to think inside the patient's brain. What's the brain thinking to make that happen? What has what the brain suddenly thought? Why? I'm warm. I'm warm. Yeah, that'd be one thought. But in fact, the, the brain is thinking something else. The brain is, uh, we can think like a thermostat, controls the temperature. It goes down a little bit. What does the body do? You vasoconstrict. If it goes down a little further, what do you do? You shiver. And if it goes up, what do you do? You, you vasodilate first and then you sweat. <laughs> That's right. The other thing you do if the temperature goes down is you put on more clothes. So we maintain the temperature within a very narrow range as we go along here. It may depend on the time of day. You get later in the day, the range that we control it at goes up, but it's very narrow, very narrow. And what happens with anesthesia? Well, that would be one thought. You reset the set point. So you go from there down to there. But in fact, that's not what happens. What happens is that the whole thing broadens. The whole thing broadens. So instead of holding it tight with anesthesia, it broadens out. And the deeper the anesthesia, the more it broadens. What clinical implications are there other than uh, the fact that you get colder because you transfer heat from the core to the periphery? What else? Clinically, a very simple thing. Can't start? Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say your blood pressure will drop if you vasodilate. So part of it would be vasodilation and a decrease in peripheral resistance, so blood pressure decrease. Yep. Change our MAC value. If the temperature drops, that's right. It would. Can't start an IV. Can't start an IV. How are you going to do that? How are you going to start an IV? Wait until they're anesthetized. I mean, if you can get an, an, a small IV and get them anesthetized with that, and then start another large bore if you need a large bore after they're anesthetized, use the volatile for your benefit. Right. Let's go on to effects of anesthetics at deeper levels. What does uh, maintenance of anesthesia with a potent inhaled agent do to blood pressure? Everybody. Decreases. decreases. Thank you. There you are. It decreases blood pressure. What does it do to heart rate at deeper levels of anesthesia? Everybody. Decreases. Now, there's a little bit of a difference here. Um, 
dose range tends to increase it at a lighter level of anesthesia than sevoflurane, but they all, at deeper levels of anesthesia, tend to increase it. What do they do to systemic vascular resistance? Increases. Except for what anesthetic? Healthy. Healthy. Good. So they decrease systemic vascular resistance. What do all the anesthetics except halothane do to cardiac index? Everybody said no change. Right, they're unchanged. But with halothane, you do get depression of cardiac health output. Now, it gets more complicated when you look over the duration of anesthesia. If you look a long time, we anesthetized volunteers at one and a quarter mac with sevoflurane on one occasion and desferine on another occasion for eight hours of anesthesia. And the blood pressure and heart rate were not constant over eight hours. They changed. They changed. So initially, there was a decrease in heart rate. You see that here? And a greater decrease in blood pressure. And then with time, the heart rate crept up, as did the cardiac output. And for eight hours, the blood pressure crept up. But there was no difference between desferane and sevoflurane. They were identical. This is 9% desferane and 3% sevoflurane. In the previous figures, I didn't note it, perhaps should have, was that there's minimal effect of substituting nitrous oxide for a portion of the anesthetic. What if we change from what I've been showing you here, which is the effects of uh, these potent inhaled agents on volunteers, no surgical stimulation, volunteers with controlled ventilation to volunteers with spontaneous ventilation. What's going to change then? Two things will change, and they are one and two. What's going to change? Gentlemen at the back here. If we change from spontaneous to controlled ventilation, what are we going to change that should influence or may influence cardiovascular? Hemodynamics. You'll have uh, lower minute ventilation when you go to spontaneous ventilation and right. lower total anesthetic, okay. or at least total anesthetic concentration. But we can control that by manipulating the inspired concentration and the delivery concentration. So we can keep the alveolar concentration constant, despite, as you say, the potential effect of an effect on ventilation. What will the decrease in ventilation do to CO2? Increase. And was that going to have a circulatory effect? We'd expect it to, yeah. We would expect it to. Mm -hmm. What else is going to change when we go from controlled ventilation to spontaneous ventilation as far as what happens inside the chest? Uh, venous return. What will happen to venous return? With spontaneous ventilation, we'd have increased venous return. Why would that be? We have negative pressure in the thoracic cavity instead of positive pressure. Right. So both of those would suggest that things like cardiac output would go up Right? And peripheral resistance might go down. For what reason? I'm not sure. Okay. What should CO2 do directly to the vessels in any tissue? Vasodilate. Peripheral resistance should go down. Okay. And that's what happens. You can see more details in the book. I'm going to go on to what MAC bar is and MAC intubation is, MAC IT. Again, let's have the definition of what, what was, what's MAC bar? MAC bar is uh, where you basically have the lining of your autonomic response is 50% of people. Right. Blockade of the autonomic response. That's the bar part of this. And MAC intubation is the concentration uh, at which you get suppression of the response to placement of a tracheal tube. The MAC bar may differ among the anesthetics. The differences aren't great. It appears that MAC bar is greater for sevoflurane than for desferane or isoflurane. But uh, these haven't really been compared in the same studies. Um, we're going to look at a couple of examples of MAC bar in terms of the cardiovascular response to surgical stimulation now. Let's see what they are. James, we have a relatively healthy patient today for lumbar laminectomy. And we're about to start the incision. Um, we're on a concentration of desferane of uh, two-thirds max. What yes. else have we done to that? We've also 
added nitrous oxide at half max, and we're currently running oxygen at about 50 percent. Okay, we've given no narcotics. We've given no narcotics. We've given some benzodiazepine sedation. Yes. And we're at steady state now. Our blood pressure is 105 over 70. Heart rate is stable at, we'll wait for this interference, 52. And we've been stable for about 10 minutes, correct? Yes. The surgeons are ready to make their incision. We'd like to demonstrate the effect of the surgical stimulation on blood pressure and heart rate. And then we'll change our desferent concentration by increasing it after we see a hemodynamic response. Okay. And we'll see how long it takes to recover. Okay. James, Dr. Kelly's making the incision now. Again, we've been at steady state heart rate of 52. Blood pressure now 116 over 70 prior to incision. And it's been uh, seven minutes now since the incision, and we've been watching the hemodynamics. There really has been a minimal change. What did you notice? Uh, well, we've actually made no changes with our volatile agents, and we've maintained uh, heart rate and blood pressure within an adequate range. So right, really right now we're at 122 over 85. Uh, we've come up from 116 over 70, and uh, really the trend has been unremarkable. Mm -hmm. James, it's been 12 minutes now since the incision, and we're starting to note some changes. Can you tell us what's happening? Uh, yes, we are starting to see a slight increase in heart rate, and the blood pressure has gone up from 116 over 70 to 135 over 89. There's been no local used in the incision as well. Okay, so then we could attribute this to the surgical stimulation. Yes. What would you like to do about it? Uh, well, I'd like to double the concentration of desflurane and see if we can come back to it. All right, we're in that title of uh, 3.8. Why don't we just overpressurize a bit, and why don't we also increase our flows, perhaps to 2 and 2. James, our dial has been on 9%, and we see that our end tidal concentration has increased now up to 7.3. Tell us what's happened. Well, as we've increased our MAC uh, nearing MAC bar, we can see that our heart rate has come back down to 61, and our blood pressure is almost exactly what it was prior to incision. Okay, we have another one cycling right now. Let's see what this one is. Uh, noting that, indeed, it's only been three minutes now since we increased the dial, okay? But we've been at uh, an end tile for no more than uh, one minute or so. And here again, our blood pressure is 114 over 82. So we have restored the blood pressure very quickly uh, back to its normal values in approximately two minutes. This morning we anesthetized a patient with desferrin, and we used a low flow rate, one liter per minute, four percent desferrin, and fifty percent nitrous oxide. And we saw what the cardiovascular response was to incision, lumbar laminectomy. Tell me what we're doing with this patient that might be different. We're duplicating the, sec the technique, but we substituted sevoflurane. We still have a one liter flow. We have an entitled sevoflurane concentration of one point two and a 50% oxygen nitrous mixture. And what does that produce in the cardiovascular responses or kind of cardiovascular status? Currently our blood pressure is 93 over 58 with a heart rate of 79. And we're going to have a, an incision shortly. Yes, sir. And we're going to see how the blood pressure and pulse rate respond. Yes. And compare that to what happened with this rate. Correct. Sounds good. Yes, Let's good. see what happens. Okay. It's now two minutes after incision has been made. What do you see? There has been a sympathetic response. Her heart rate is up to 90, and her blood pressure has increased to 111 over 68. Okay, let's see what happens at five minutes, just as we did in the previous case with this one. Has the cardiovascular system changed anymore? No, actually the heart rate still remains above 90, and the blood pressure has not returned to baseline. All right, let's see if we can make a return to baseline by doubling the vaporizer concentration. Tell us what you're doing. I'm going to double the vaporizer concentration to 3.2. We're going to give that, just as we did this morning, a couple minutes to do its magic. Yes, sir. Okay. Our entitled concentration currently is 1.6. And we have had somewhat of a decrease in our heart rate, but the blood pressure is still at 112 over 69. Actually, the heart rate's almost back to the control level, isn't it? Yes. Well, let's give it another few minutes and see what that does. Now it's 
five minutes after we turn the seal off right. And what's happened now? Well, our vital signs have returned to baseline. Our blood pressure is now 96 over 64. As you recall, our baseline was 92 over 60, and the heart rate is 78. Our baseline was 77. So the sebo has been quite effective in returning the cardiovascular signs back to where they were. So there wasn't, even, wasn't much to compare between those two. They, they both allowed a, an autonomic response to the stimulus of surgery. And in both, the autonomic response was limited, not bad, and in both, it appeared to be attenuated ultimately by raising the anesthetic concentration to above MAC bar. We've seen two demonstrations of MAC bar. We've seen that two anesthetics, esferine and sevoflurane, do not suppress, do not prevent the cardiovascular response to the stimulation of surgery. We've seen that in the absence of fentanyl, these two anesthetics are not perfect analgesics. Now, if we add fentanyl, we should change those dynamics because fentanyl synergistically decreases MAC bar. And we can see that in this slide, which shows that MAC bar is a fraction of sevoflurane MAC in children, decreases dramatically with what are reasonably small doses of fentanyl. So it decreases from maybe 1.4 times MAC down to well under MAC. This parallels the effect on MAC itself, doesn't it? Fentanyl acts synergistically to decrease MAC. It acts synergistically to decrease MAC bar. Let's see the use of fentanyl to treat the cardiovascular response to the stimulus. We introduced anesthesia, use of propofol, and we maintained anesthesia with desferin at 6%. They've begun their procedure, and we noticed that the pulse rate and blood pressure have done what? Basically, we've we'll got an increase in blood pressure mm -hmm. to 177 over 116. We've we'll got an increase in heart rate to 121 since what? incision. Why does that happen? Basically, we have given minimal narcotics and we have surgical incision. And Deschlarin is a very poor analgesic agent. Okay, so what should we do? We can give some more fat now. All right, let's do this. Let's give some fat. You're going to give how much? Yeah, 150 mics of fentanyl. Okay. There it goes. Okay, we've given 150 mics of fentanyl. What's that done? Basically, it's brought our blood pressure down to 110 over 78. It's brought our heart rate down to 56. What does that tell you about how analgesic or how much analgesia desperate supply are? Basically, it tells us it probably doesn't give very much. Doesn't give very much. Does it? Okay, just like all potent inhaled anesthetics. They're not very good analgesic agents. Okay? MAC bar is uh, considerably above MAC itself. So is the MAC for tracheal intubation. So the MAC IT is well above uh, MAC itself, or it can be. And the anesthetics may not act equally to suppress the response to tracheal intubation. So the arterial blood pressure at 2 MAC after tracheal intubation in healthy adult patients may go up much more with sevoflurane than it does with halothane or isoflurane. Now this may be artifactual, artifactual in the sense that can we maintain 2 MAC? In which anesthetics are we apt to maintain 2 MAC better, particularly if the patients are breathing spontaneously? The more soluble ones. So maybe this simply reflects a difference in the amount of anesthetic that remains. And with poorly soluble agents, you may expect to see a greater re response than with the more soluble anesthetics. Now we're going to turn to a different topic, which is differences among anesthetics in the response to induction of anesthesia, particularly at concentrations exceeding MAC. And the um, study that prompted all this was a study by uh, Ebert, Ebert observed that with desferrin, going from 1 mac to 1.5 mac, you got cardiovascular stimulation. But if you did the same thing with sevoflurane, you got only cardiovascular depression. And this is from his work. Tom Ebert showed that the heart rate, when you increased the vaporizer setting from 1 mac to 1.5 mac, 
The heart rate went up, and then it came back down again, all in the space of perhaps eight minutes or so. With sevoflurane, there was a progressive decrease in the heart rate, a difference now between desperate and sevoflurane, where before, during maintenance of anesthesia, we saw no difference at all. Let's look at this in uh, the operating room, showing the effect of so doubling death rate from 6 to 12 percent with no pre-medication with fentanyl. What we do is to increase our death rate concentration anticipating the incision. So okay. why don't we double our dial okay. concentration from 6 to 12 percent. 12 percent here. And with a fresh gas flow of 6 liters per minute, we have a relatively favorable time constant for the washing of desferane. So if we draw our attention here to the Inspired, notice how very quickly the Inspired concentration of desferane is rising. Immediately, in just two cycles, we've gone from six to 11, and approaching 12% on the dial. And because of the relative insolubility of desferane, I think we're gonna see a very rapid uh, equilibration in FA over FI. That's correct. Can you predict anything that might occur with this uh, rapid increase in desperate, noting the hemodynamics? Well, the patient had previously leveled off with a pulse rate in the 50s and a blood pressure in the 130s, systolic over 60s. Uh, we might see more of a hyperdynamic state in which the pulse rate and the blood pressure transiently increase. I would expect that to take a few minutes. Well, I think we're beginning to see it now, actually. You notice the pulse rate has increased approximately 10 beats a minute in yeah. the last 30 seconds. Now, there's been no surgical stimulation, is that correct? And that's correct. Oh, look at the, what is this here? Well, our blood pressure is increasing to go along with the increase in pulse rate. And look at this. Well, this is exactly what we had predicted would happen, isn't it? That's very consistent with the rapid increase in desferrin. So let, let's just notice here that our desferrin has gone from 6 to 9.4% end tidal in just 60 seconds while we're talking. And we've had an increase of, uh, a dramatic increase in blood pressure and uh, a heart rate that has gone up over 60% in just 60 seconds. That's correct. All right, if we continue to watch this, what do you predict happening? Uh, over about 10 to 15 minutes, the patient will gradually return to their baseline barring any surgical stimulus. And if this was undesirable, how could we attenuate the effects of desferrin on blood pressure and heart rate? Well, we could premedicate the patient with opioids, anticipating a rapid change in desferrin. Uh -huh. So we've given no opioid, have we? This cardiovascular stimulation that we've seen is mediated by rapidly adapting receptors that are mainly, although not exclusively, in the arterial systemic circulation. <coughs> the um, rapid adaptation is shown by the fact that the blood pressure increase and the heart rate increase go up and then come down within the space of about 46 minutes normally. It can also be shown in another way, and this was shown by Dick Weisskopf. Weisskopf looked at this increase that occurs with a step change in alveolar concentration, in this case from 4 to 8 percent, within the space of one minute, usually about 30 seconds. You see this dramatic increase in blood pressure, which returns to control levels six minutes after the start. What was even more interesting was Weisskopf's study then had the alveolar concentration brought back to 4 percent, held for another 30 minutes, and then increased a second time to 8%. And look at the absence of any really meaningful change in the blood pressure. Did it a third time, and again, no meaningful change. So these receptors that mediate whatever this response is rapidly adapt to the higher concentration of desperate. There can be minimization or elimination of this response to increasing concentrations of desperate by one of several things. One can never go above 6%. If you never go above 6%, not a problem. Or you can go above 6% doing it very slowly, although there's a limit to how effective that approach is. Or, as was suggested in the film we saw a moment ago, you can give some fentanyl. And we're going to show you, with a little film here, the effect of uh, 
double investment, six to twelve percent will vaporize it. After, in this case, pre-medication with fentanyl. If it does, having given some opioid, what's the blood pressure and heart rate now? The blood pressure is ninety over sixty-six. When our heart rate is fifty-seven. Okay. All right. Let's turn the death frame from where it is now. Where is it now? It's at six percent. Okay. And let's go to twelve percent. Okay, and that's with a what flow of oxygen? That's at five liters per minute of oxygen. Okay. All right, let's see what that does. Okay, Jennifer, it's been two minutes since we increased the concentration to 12%. What's happened? So that we've seen a small increase in blood pressure to 118 over 76, a slight increase in heart rate to 72. Okay, that's less than it was before we gave it that, was it? That's right, she was 120 when we gave it. Okay. And that's despite the fact that the concentration of desferin is at 12% on the vaporizer, and where is it? Still at 12%. Still 12%. And how about on the monitor? On the monitor, we're reading an end title of 10 and an inspired of 11.1. So what's the fentanyl done to her cardiovascular response to this? It's blunt of the cardiovascular response. It's and that blunting has been shown in several studies, uh, studies by Tom Ebert, studies by Weisskopf, such as uh, this one. One where uh, you see the original increase in heart rate or blood pressure without premedication, and then uh, half that if you give 1.5 mics per kilo of fentanyl, and even less if you give higher doses of fentanyl. So you can minimize this cardiovascular response by giving a bit of opioid. So we think sevoflurane gets off scot-free, not quite, not quite. Um, if you give high concentrations of sevoflurane, there is an opposite effect uh, that is of potential concern in children. Our concern in children is much less an increase in heart rate, it's a concern in, in adults because of the potential for cardiovascular disease, particularly coronary artery disease. But in children, our concern is bradycardia. Our concern is bradycardia because protection of cardiac output requires a sustained heart rate in children, more than in adults. And high concentrations of sevoflurane for induction of anesthesia in children can produce profound bradycardia, not very often. But when it occurs, it's of concern. So be aware of that, and be aware that you can manage it by rapidly decreasing the concentration of sevoflurane. Okay, which of the inhaled anesthetics is arrhythmogenic as far as ventricular arrhythmias is concerned? What about the other anesthetics? Zero concern. Give as much epinephrine as you like. Use in a case for elimination of a pheochromocytoma. Uh, what about the arrhythmias that are induced by an acute myocardial infarction? Experimentally, what do anesthetics like desferrin and halothane and sevoflurane do? Diminish them. What about if you've got an increased QT interval? Is there one anesthetic that might be of concern? SIBO. So if you've got an increased QT interval, a very slow heart rate, you'd be a little bit more careful in the use of SIBO flurin. What effect do the potent inhaled anesthetics have on barrel reflexes? Everybody. What do they do to barrel reflexes? They blunt them. them or decrease them. Now one of the interesting questions is, are, are the potent inhaled anesthetics a friend or a foe to the heart that has compromised circulation. We've got a study uh, that looked at this, uh, one of the early studies with Desferrin. This was the Hellman study, published in anesthesiology, and got a lot of controversy. This was a study of 200 patients with coronary artery disease. They, we knew they had coronary artery disease because they were all to have a bypass graft, in fact, several bypass grafts. Half of them were anesthetized with Desferrin and half with Sufentanil. Now, those who got desferrin got 10% for induction of anesthesia. What do you suppose that might do to the circulation? They would become hyperdynamic. So you have an increase in 
and blood pressure. What might that do in terms of the appearance of ischemia? Would heighten the appearance of ischemia. Okay, and that's what they found. They found a greater incidence of ischemia on induction with desferine than with sufenamide, significantly. But then they found this, a more severe ischemia during maintenance with sufenamide, and that was significant. Less severity of ischemia during maintenance, and no difference between the groups in outcomes. No difference in mortality, no difference in myocardial infarction, no difference in uh, things like the need for significant support of the circulation. What about this greater ischemia during maintenance with sufentanil? Is that really an increase with sufentanil or does it reflect a protection against myocardial ischemia with uh, desferin? In fact, uh, there is considerable evidence uh, that suggests that we can get protection from the inhaled anesthetics. We, we know that you can get, using the inhaled anesthetics in experimental models, you can get enhanced contractile recovery after myocardial vessel inclusion. You can get a decreased infarct size from occlusion by the use of potent inhaled anesthetics. You can protect against reperfusion injury. And these compounds may act similarly to mimic ischemic preconditioning of the heart. You all know what that is? Make the heart ischemic, and it's less vulnerable to subsequent episodes of ischemia. It's preconditioned. As far as the infarct size, uh, the studies that have been done in animals uh, suggest that desferine has a greater effect, more protective effect, than propofol or isoflurane or sevoflurane. And that may be what we're seeing in this differential in the Hellman study. Desferine may be protecting the heart, not that sufentanil is hurting. I should add that for several studies comparing the various inhaled anesthetics among themselves or with opioid approaches to anesthesia, there is no difference though in outcomes in patients who are at risk of coronary artery disease. So they all are about the same. Now another thing you should know about, and was of considerable controversy a while ago, was something called coronary steel. How can you steal a coronary? What is coronary steel? What is it? Well, coronary steel referred to uh, vasodilation of basically normal, normal, healthy coronary arteries, and you would actually shunt or divert blood flow from the stenotic areas and have a result in ischemia. Okay. Would you agree with that, Tracy? Yes, and it's the stenotic areas that are receiving collateral flow. Right. So you've got to add that dimension to it. And in fact, it's even more complicated than that. So we got a, we got a vessel coming down a coronary artery, and it's got a, an occlusion, not an occlusion, a stenosis. But it isn't, it isn't a bad stenosis. And this vessel goes to a bed here. And from this vessel, or from the bed, we have some collateral vessels going to an area that's just getting barely enough to stay alive. Now we give our isoflurane or desferane or sevoflurane, and we cause vasodilation in the normal bed. Because there is a partial obstruction here, what's that going to do to the blood pressure here? Decrease. It'll lower it. It'll decrease it. And by decreasing it, it may compromise the collateral flow. It may steal blood from here to here. And that was suggested by Sebastian Reese and a study that he did of isoflurane, a study in which he gave patients with known coronary artery disease isoflurane, <clears throat> and he found that he got vasodilation of the coronary arteries, and he found that he got ischemia, myocardial ischemia. Did that prove that there was coronary steel? What he also failed to do was keep the blood pressure from going down. What would happen if the blood pressure went way down? What would happen to coronary vascular resistance? It would decrease with autoregulation. Vessels would open up. If the blood pressure went way down and you had 
stenotic vessels, what would that do to perfusion of the myocardium? It would, it would decrease it. Chances of producing myocardial ischemia are therefore increased. So what he did was, he showed indeed that there was vasodilation, but it probably did not have to do as much with the anesthetic as it had to do with the fact that he got hypotension. And the myocardial ischemia similarly probably was unrelated to the anesthetic, was related to the hypertension. Subsequent studies of coronary steel have suggested that there really isn't an important issue with any of the potent inhaled anesthetics. Finally, let's talk about regional blood flow. We talked about pulmonary blood flow when we talked about hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. What about the heart? What in general is the effect of uh, the inhaled anesthetics on resistance to blood flow through the heart? Lowers it decreases. It decreases, tends to decrease resistance. In fact, the anesthetics tend to decrease resistance through all tissues. Now, sometimes this doesn't become evident because there's a concurrent effect that anesthetics have on all tissues. What do anesthetics do to tissues that's going to indirectly influence vascular resistance? Lower their metabolic rate. Say it louder. Lower what it's going to do? Lower their metabolic rate. So if it lowers their metabolic rate, what should that do to resistance? Well, it decreases their CO2 production, decreases right. their lactate production, that, all that tends to lower their um, vascular resistance. Lower it or raise it? I'm sorry, increase. It would increase resistance. And the fact that you sometimes see no change in the face of that uh, suggests that resistance is decreased or would tend to be decreased. You see increases in the oxygen, in the venous blood, leaving almost all tissues. So we have a tendency to a decrease in resistance, a tendency to sustained or even increased flow in some beds, particularly the brain, for example. We have a change in autoregulation. What's autoregulation? For example, what's cerebral autoregulation? What does that mean? Who, who wants to volunteer? We get several volunteers. Let's see, we haven't talked to you for a while. Within a given set point of range of blood pressures, uh, the, uh, the vascular beds either constrict or vasodilate to maintain that certain pressure within a wide range of blood pressures. Maintain blood flow. Yes, correct. Within, within right. a wide, wide range. That's exactly right. A very nice description. What uh, what happens to autoregulation when we give an inhaled anesthetic, potent inhaled anesthetic? So we, we, let me let me just draw what you've just said. This is blood pressure, and this is uh, cerebral blood flow. Uh, we've got a range over which cerebral blood flow doesn't change, despite change in blood pressure. And then you get below a certain level, and what happens to blood flow? Decreases. It goes down. And you get above a certain point, it increases. It will increase. What are these What are these limits here and here? About what numerically? Yeah, about 50 and about 150. Okay? Now what does anesthesia do with that? It increases and raises it. It raises the whole thing. That's right. And in fact, it, it does this. So it narrows the range over which autoregulation occurs. There is the belief that we shouldn't go below 50 because we lose autoregulation. And it's, uh, the, the autoregulation is telling us that tissues are suffering. Does that mean you can't go below 50 without causing a cerebral infarct? Quinn is shaking his head now. Well, not necessarily. But if you gave them barbiturates or some other method of cerebral protection, you could go below. If what about inhaled anesthetic? If they're found to be protective, that might have a, a factor in letting you go lower than you would ordinarily. Well, that concludes our discussion of the circulatory effects of inhaled anesthetics. Any questions?